church. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. I apologize about the air conditioner, but there are some things you just can't control. Uh, we have a nice breeze up here, so if you feel like you want to move and take advantage of this, you're welcome to. Anyway, welcome to worship this morning. I'm glad that you are here on this Father's Day morning. Happy Father's Day. Today we remember all of the men in our lives, uh, and uh, today I am making root beer floats after church today in honor of my dad who wanted to make sure that you ate dessert first because life is uncertain and so that's what we're going to do is eat our dessert uh, before dinner and if you want to hang around and have a root beer float they're in the lounge where the air conditioner is on and uh, very comfortable in there and or grab it and go whatever you want to do so that's happening today and I hope that you have the opportunity to enjoy this beautiful day in the way that God intended you saw some of the announcements scrolling across the screen. Uh, next Sunday after church, if you'd like to eat together, uh, bring a picnic lunch and I'll bring desserts and drinks and we'll, we'll just sit out on the lawn, maybe set up a couple tables in the shade uh, and have lunch together after church if you'd like to do that. Uh, there will also be an elders meeting in the evening next Sunday evening. We do that via Zoom still so far. So that's happening again. Welcome to all of you again to worship today. Know that God is present with us wherever you are. God is there. And so we prepare our hearts and our minds for worshiping God. So let us call ourselves to worship as those who are able stand and join in our call to worship that's printed on the screen. Please join me. <clears throat> Our call to worship is based on Psalm chapter 68, verses 4 and 5. Come sing praises to God. Rejoice in his presence. For he is our God, a father to the fatherless and the defender of all who need protection. The one in whom the lonely find a home and the prisoner finds release. Bless the Lord, the God of our salvation, who carries and strengthens us day after day. Let us worship God together.
And so, as we always do at this time in our service, we come to God in prayer, allowing me to speak to God on our behalf, but at the same time, thinking about uh, your own prayers and your own thoughts to God. Scripture lesson today being the woman at the well and Jesus offering her living water. And how, how does living water, the living water that comes from God, affect us as we live out our days as followers of Christ? And so we come to this uh, time of prayer to sort of be thankful for that. God's gift of living water that comes to us and the water that we share with each other, both physical and spiritual. And so I invite you today to join with me in this time and in this attitude of prayer. Holy God, whose spirit moved over the waters at the dawn of creation, hear our prayer today. We pray today for all those who thirst. We pray for those in our lives, in our world, who might be spiritually thirsty. People who long to know your presence and love. Those who are searching for meaning and purpose. Oh, healing God, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray today for all those who are physically thirsty who don't have enough water to drink or feed their animals, whose fields are parched, those who have to walk long distances to find enough water to survive, or have to be content with water that is unclean. We pray for those whose homes and villages are torn apart because of drought or famine. O oh, healing God, pour down your waters and heal your people. We pray today for those who are thirsty for justice, who long for an equal sharing of resources among people and nations, who put their lives at risk to protect streams and rivers and oceans, those who are working diligently to find clean water and make it available to those who need it. O oh, healing God, pour down your waters and heal your people. God, we would ask that you would open our hearts to the needs of all who thirst. Give us courage to work together for justice, to stand alongside those who are thirsty so that all people everywhere may live without want or fear. And may we all discover the abundant life that you promised to each one of us. For it is in the name of Jesus, our source of living water, that we pray this prayer and also come to you together praying the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And so our scripture lesson for this morning. First of all, a psalm. From the 86th chapter of the book of Psalm, verses 11 through 13. You may recognize it. Oh, it's up there. Good. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart, that I may honor you. With all my heart, I will praise you, O Lord my God. I will give glory to your name forever. For your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. And our story for today, the story of the woman at the well. Let me just read you the story first, and then we'll talk about her a little bit. So I need to start off 
In the very first part of the Gospel of John, the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, her story is in verses 4 through 19. So, here we go. Listen carefully. See what you might have picked out from this story that maybe you didn't know before because there are a number of things that I did. So Jesus had to go through Samaria on the way. So, on, well, we'll talk about where the way is in a minute. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. That's significant. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who I am, you and who I am, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this is a very deep well. Where would you get this living water? And besides, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his cattle enjoy? And Jesus replied, people soon become thirsty again after drinking this water. But the water I give them takes away their thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual strength, a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me some of this water and then I'll never have to be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to haul water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus says, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritans claim it's here in Mount Gerizim, whom our ancestors worshiped, and it goes on and on and on. And we'll, we'll talk about why it goes on and on and on. But then we get to the end of the, end of the story. And we hear these last couple of verses where it says, The woman left her jar beside the well, and she ran back to the village and told everyone, Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Messiah? So people came streaming from the village to see him. And then you jump down and it says, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because of what the woman had said. All right. So again, the third in a series of four for out of this book, Bad Girls of the Bible. Just for something fun and different. So just to recap. We first looked at the original bad girl who was Eve, and then we looked at uh, the, a woman who was bad to the bone, and that was Delilah. And today we look at a woman who was bad for a season, bad for a time, but not forever. And that was the woman at the well. And next week we look at a woman who was just bad for a moment. She just made one, one, one giant blooper, and that is the sinful woman out of Luke 7. So, four weeks of biblical women who got it wrong and four weeks of seeing ourselves in those characters. Now, the first thing you have to understand about this story is location, location, location. Okay? Because it's key. So we know that Jesus is in the town of Sychar, which is in the country of Samaria. Now, I want you to picture a map. I should have put a map up, but I want you to picture a map in your mind, okay, of Palestine, and the country to uh, the, the south, no, sorry, the country to the north is, is uh, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, Cana, where all those first miracles of Jesus took place, okay? And then south is the country of Judea and the city of Jerusalem, the hub of Jewish activity, 
And in the middle of those two countries, in the middle of the desert, is Samaria. Okay? So, Jesus is up here, and he wants to get down here to Jerusalem, for, because John, that's really important. we got to get Jesus to Jerusalem for all the bad stuff to happen, but he's got to get there first. He's in Cana, been to a wedding, turned water into wine, all that stuff. And now he's moving, okay? So he's moving south. He has to go through to Samaria to get there. Now, the thing about that is you don't want to go there because Jews and Samaritans do not mix, okay? They do not mix. Now, granted, it's hard to get from one country to the other without going through there. You have to go through there, but it is unfriendly territory to Jews. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan, okay? All those people who just wanted to get through that country, walked on by, did nothing, okay? Just get me through this thing, okay? It is unfriendly territory to Jews. But the one thing that Jews and Samaritans do have in common is that they both get thirsty, <laughs> Jacob's well was there. It still is there if you travel to the Holy Land. And it was once a source of water in a parched and dry and mountainous desert. So it was the woman who came to the well. It was, sorry, it was the women. I'm also setting the scene for you. So it was the women who came to the well to draw water for their families. The women who came to draw water from their families came early in the morning because we're in the heat of the desert, okay? So they come early in the morning, get their work done, draw their water, get at home. Significant that the Samaritan woman is there at high noon, okay? So the women came to the water, the well to draw water for their families. By all accounts, Jesus should not have been there. Guys, don't go there, okay? By all accounts, Jesus should not have been there, but he was. And it was high noon of the day. So we can assume, maybe, that he had been traveling in scorching heat all morning and finding something to drink was welcome relief for Jesus. So the woman comes to the well. Jesus is there. It's high noon. She already has two strikes against her. Number one, she was a Samaritan, not a Jew. And number two, she was female. So the writer of the Gospel of John, who is the only one to even record this story, doesn't even give her name. She doesn't even have a name. Why? Because no one cares. No one cares cares about her and no one cares that she has to come to the well at high noon in the middle of the heat in a desert nobody cares but Jesus cares Jesus cares and he speaks to her and he asks her for a drink think of it now think about that Jesus the Lord reaching out to someone who was in all intent and purposes a social reject and his words, can you give me a drink, start this lengthy conversation. It is the longest conversation recorded between Jesus and anybody in the entire scripture. Her gender, her nationality, and even her lifestyle, those are not incidental in the story. They are integral. Because it drives home the truth of God's amazing grace that the refreshing waters of Christ are meant for every human being willing to hold out an empty cup. Let me not get ahead of myself, however. So why was she there midday? She was there midday to avoid the neighborhood gossips, no doubt. This was a God thing, though, because she was there alone at the well. Jesus was alone at the well because the disciples had gone grocery shopping. So it was just the two of them. And that's significant. I don't know about you, and this is something that kind of came in my head as I was reviewing this story. I don't know about you, but when Christ speaks to my heart, 
It's always just the two of us. I don't know. How about you? When I'm alone in prayer, that's when Christ speaks to my heart. I don't think it's insignificant that they were there by themselves. Anyway, he asks for a drink. And the woman, barely looking up, like this, asks, why are you even talking to me? And Jesus responds, if you only knew who was asking. And that opens the door for this conversation. Now, I think this woman is really gutsy. I never really looked at her as gutsy before, but I think she's a gutsy woman. Because she pushes Jesus into this theological discussion she knows the history of this place where she is. This talk of living water baffles her, but she presses on, and so does he. They get into this theological discussion, and then Jesus says, go get your husband. Oh, man, they were doing so well in conversation, too. A Samaritan good girl does not have this kind of conversation with a Jewish man. By asking her, however, to go get her husband, I believe that Jesus was honoring her so that her reputation would not be any more tarnished than it already was by seeing the two of them there talking to each other. But here it comes, and you can imagine, looking down, I have no husband. We can almost hear it. The hesitancy, the embarrassment. But then the miracle because Jesus already knows everything about her. And he said, yep, you have no husband, all right. In fact, you've had five of them, and the man you have now is not one of them. Hmm, what happens then? Does she confess? Does she rend her garments? Does she reach for sackcloth and ashes? Does she start crying? Does she beg for forgiveness? Nope, not this gutsy female. She did what anybody in her situation would do. She changed the subject. <laughs> We've been there, done that, haven't we? When someone pushes us to talk about our sins or our mistakes or, our, or the things we're not proud of, when someone pushes us to do that, our own... A personal relationship with Christ? What do we do? We change the subject. Boy, do you know what's going on in church right now? We'd much rather talk about the church than talk about having an authentic relationship to Christ in our life, whatever that would mean for our life. So we're not that much different than she. Then, after all of this, Jesus reveals himself to her, and it's customary to the writer of the book of John. You'll see it in other characters. This light bulb goes off. And she recognizes him as the Messiah. And here's what I have in capital letters, in bold print, in my notes. It says, and now this former bad girl was about to make the decision of her life. What's it going to be, bad girl? And that decision was what? She believed, right? She believed. She believed in Jesus. She believed that she had met someone who would change her life forever. And she believed and was so overcome that she left her ladle and her bucket right there and she ran into the village to tell everybody else what had just happened. You're not going to believe this. Now, this was no accident. She left her bucket and her ladle. What is that a symbol of? She left that sinful nature, that sinful lifestyle of hers behind and she ran into the village and she shouted to everyone, come and see, come and see. You might recognize the translation is, come and see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. And why did the people of Sychar believe her, a woman of her reputation? Simple. Because she had seen Christ and now, People are seeing Christ in her. A changed life gets people's attention every time. And scripture says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of that woman's testimony. It's a remarkable story, if you think of it in biblical terms. 
Her faith could not be contained. The woman with no name left behind not only her discarded water pot, but her shame as well, never to embrace it again. The woman at the well, Miss No Name, I call her. One of the very first evangelists ever. Hmm. What do you think we can learn from her? Well, I think we can learn from her that not lying is not the same as telling the truth. I had to think about that one a minute. Not lying is not the same as telling the truth. Just like Jesus knew everything about this woman, God knows everything about us. The woman didn't really lie, but she certainly wasn't very truthful either. And for those of us who know God, those little games don't work. And those little games are no longer appropriate because we confess our sins and our deepest fears and our hidden actions to God because God loves us completely and already knows our very being. We can also learn that thirst is a gift from God. Just like our human bodies have this mechanism for letting us know when we're thirsty, our spiritual body has the same mechanism and we can recognize, recognize our need for refreshment when we need that source of living water. We know when we need time with our Savior. We know when our spiritual life gets out of whack. We know when we need that living water. Psalm 42, 2 says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And the last thing I think we can learn from her is that living water is meant to be shared, not hoarded. The woman could have tried to keep that good news of Jesus all to herself. Do you know how much guts that took for her to run into the village and say that? She could have kept that conversation right under wraps. And she could have said, no way am I going into that town. They hate me anyway. This will really push them over the edge. That may be something I might have thought about saying. But she didn't. The reality is that she couldn't have kept that secret even if she wanted to. Her joy was too full. Her faith meant too much. That decision was meant to be shared. And I'll tell you what, you and I, we cannot keep the good news of our Savior to ourselves. We can't do it. And here's the thing. Here's the thing about her and about what it means to us. Our past doesn't matter to God. It doesn't matter. Our mistakes, they do not define us. We cannot get hung up on our past because God doesn't. We must accept God's forgiveness and move on. We must forgive ourselves and point our way towards God's purpose. What matters to God is how we take our now and use it to share God's love with those around us. I hope you learned something from the woman at the well today. Let's take that living water and share it with those we meet. I don't know, let's pray about that. I just want to thank you, God, for putting this story in front of us today, the story of the woman at the well. And we come to you, people full of mistakes, and histories, well, good and bad. And yet, God, you come to us and you meet us where we are and you offer us the forgiving, life-giving water that only comes from you. Forgive us when we don't share it, when we hoard it. Give us the ability to run to others to share the good news of your love and your forgiveness. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't know. What do you think? Did something jump out at you today on that story?
love to saw. Yeah. Yeah. That story could have ended very differently. Yeah. For sure. Well, I'll tell you, you and I, especially as disciples of Christ, we get an opportunity to come to this table every time we gather together, despite our faults, despite our mistakes. That table is set for us every time we gather together. God is bigger than any of our mistakes. And we come to this table every time we're together to be reminded of that. We come to the table to remember Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, the bread and the wine, symbols of this broken body and shed blood for us. And at this table, we no longer walk as people who are hunched over with burdens. We walk as forgiven and loved people of God, created in God's image. Let's come to the table, preparing our hearts for that as we sing, Fill My Cup, Lord. everyone to this table this morning where the Lord invites all of us to commune together. Let us pray. Dear God and Creator, we bow before you in humility today and ask you to examine our hearts. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sins, any rebellion that may be hindering our relationship with you. Help us to recognize that greed and money and power are not the tools needed to serve you and do not lead to fulfillment. Lord, we thank you for nature's beauty that surrounds us, for the sounds of the birds, the beautiful colors, the smell of the earth. Help us to cherish and preserve these gifts. As we take of this bread today, representing the life of our Lord Jesus, bread broken for us, help us remember and celebrate your faithfulness to all who receive you. Thank you, Lord, for your love for the promise of an abundant and eternal life. Bless this cup representing your blood poured out from a splintered cross, the supreme sacrifice for our sins. Quench our thirst for you and your blessings. Each time we take communion, Lord, may we re recommit our life and our heart, our thoughts to you. As we leave this place today, help us to share your message of love, of hope, kindness, forgiveness, of peace and generosity. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the loaf of bread and he blessed it and he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. As you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. 
And in the same way, Jesus lifted the cup and blessed it and said to his disciples, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. As you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us take our communion, bread, and cup together now. God's house today. I invite you, as we always have done throughout this whole year, to, if you'd like to stay and pray with us, you're welcome to do that. We'll do that for just a few minutes, and then um, also, again, if you'd like to grab a root beer float, you can stay and visit, or you can grab one on the way out. Those will be in the in the uh, lounge, so I hope that you'll think about doing that. Again, good to be in God's house. I hope that God's living water fills you this week and you share that good news with those you meet. I invite you to stand if you're able and sing our closing hymn, Pass It On, followed by the benediction. Let's stand together.
And now to God who is able to do far more abundantly than anything you and I can ask or think. To that God be glory and praise forever and ever. Amen.